Hello and welcome to Shelved Episode 12. I am your host, Jeremy Meyer. Alright, now this is a really fun episode for you guys today. Um, this is a script that I knew it existed for a long time, but uh, hadn't even thought about looking for it, and it's one that just kind of came to me. I was out there searching for scripts on some social media platforms, as I do every now and then, and somebody sent this one to me, and it was very unexpected, and... It, I, I had a feeling it was going to be good. It was going to be a fun read because it's based on a story that I really enjoy. And it's, uh, I'm, I we talk about this a lot in the episode, but I can never say his name right. Uh, Gilmiro, Gilmiro, Guillermo, Guillermo del Toro. He, it's it's his script, and it's at the Mountains of Madness, based on the H.P. Lovecraft story. And it's one of my favorite stories. H.P. Lovecraft, obviously a master of horror, and has such an interesting story. Um, and this was a fascinating read, and I have to say, this is my favorite script that we've read for the episode, or for the show. I really enjoyed it. He, Guillermo, really paints a picture on the page, and it was just so enjoyable. Me and my, uh, co-host for this episode, Eric Zisselman, who you should know by now, um, we both had a lot of fun reading the script. It was easily one of our favorites. It's my favorite I've read for the show, and it's just so entertaining. I highly recommend, even if you listen to the episode first, go to our Tumblr, www.shelledfilmpodcast.tumblr.com, download this script, and read it. It's so good. We, you know, we try to cover everything, but there's a lot of stuff in the writing, and just, like, the interactions of characters in the dialogue is so worth reading. It's the best thing I've read in a while, um, book, script included. And I just highly recommend checking it out. Um, so we had a lot of fun with this episode. Um, so before we get into the episode, I do want to say that I'm kicking around the idea for the mini episodes of maybe doing like just some little fun movie discussions, like some top 10 lists and stuff like that. So I was thinking if you have some top 10 lists that you'd want to hear me cover, like, oh, what are my 10 favorite movies or 10 favorite TV shows? Like any kind of movie related list that you can think of top 10 canceled TV shows, blah, blah, blah. Send them to my email, shelledfilmpodcast uh, at gmail.com. I almost said the Tumblr uh, because I, I just think that'd be fun. If you want to get to know me a little more, um, and I'm kind of putting it in your hands, you can be interactive. And if you want to leave your name or information, or if you want to promote something, uh, include it in the email. So you guys can be interactive with the show and just have a little more fun with it. All right. So we're just going to jump in today's episode, episode 12, Guillermo del Toro's at the mountains of madness. I really had fun talking about this one. So I really hope you guys enjoy it. It's been fun. Really? Yeah. It sounds really cool. Like I read, I watched the trailer and I read the Wikipedia, uh-huh. and I'm like, man, I should watch this. <laughs> I'll tell you, the um, the very start of it feels a lot like fucking Mountain of Madness. Really? Yeah, because he's he's in a fucking uh, um, in a mental institution. Yeah. And then he starts telling it back. To some guy, yeah. And then it goes flashbacks. I, w- I was because I was reading on it, and it's basically said that that movie's kind of like John Carpenter's love letter to H.P. Lovecraft. Okay. Because yeah. a lot of Lovecraft stories, the way they're done, is they are like this is someone's journal or someone's notes mm-hmm. or someone's blah blah blah. Yeah, it's. Uh, you can adjust the mic with this thing you. if you need to. Yeah, it's been it's been very cool so far. So I'm I'm very happy to be uh, checking it out. Yeah, I um, there's another one you should check out called From Beyond. Okay, it's 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 actually based on a Lovecraft short story. Mm-hmm. Which one? 
Um, I can't remember the name of it. If okay. you look up the Wikipedia page, it tells you exactly which story it's from. Because mm-hmm. he had a... T- I don't know how much you know about H.P. Lovecraft, if anything. Uh, a little bit. I just, you know, I mean, I know uh, that um, are we, we're not... We're not live yeah, it's right rolling. Now. It's rolling. Oh, it's rolling. Yeah. Okay. All I, right. I well, hey, this. hey, everybody. <laughs> I can edit this at any okay. point. All right. Hey. Uh, yeah. No. I know. Uh, I know a little bit about Lovecraft and uh, the lore that he's created surrounding, you know, yeah. Cthulhu. And I, I mean, I don't know too much about his personal uh, upbringing, but beyond uh, what he's written, yeah, I don't. I don't know a ton about him, but I definitely know a little bit. I mean, I was looking up some this morning, but um, mm-hmm. uh, From Beyond is based on the short story of the same name, so. There you go. Something um, to definitely check out. Then. Yeah, um, but that's a that's a really cool '80s movie. Uh, there's a website, Cinemassacre. It's uh-huh. where the angry video game nerd is from. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. No, no. But uh, he's he does these series of videos where he he fucking plays old games and mm-hmm. reviews them, but like yells and swears and shit. Okay. But um, he does every Halloween. He does a uh, Monster Madness, where every day in October he reviews another horror movie. Right. And each year it's kind of themed a little different. Mm-hmm. And one year he did uh, '80s a thon or whatever. So we just reviewed a bunch of '80s movies, and one of them was um, From Beyond. And I'd recommend just checking out his review of it. It's just like this crazy like. I would compare it to John Carpenter's The Thing with like mm-hmm. the monster creature sure. effects. It's kind of similar, but it's based on a Lovecraft story. Yeah, I, and it's super. It sounds super crazy. They uh, the Lovecraft definitely feels a lot like uh, something John Carpenter would uh, jump Absolutely. into. So it's it's, um, it's it's a lot of monsters and like a lot of his themes are like forbidden knowledge and mm-hmm. ancient aliens and stuff. Like yeah, you could probably no, I love ad- that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly, and it's why I've always been drawn to, especially the one we're going to be talking about today mm-hmm. in particular. I, I love his stuff. It's it's hard to read, mm-hmm. like if you actually want to read it, because yeah, these are all from like the twenties and, and from before. I've read a little bit, and the uh, the diction that he uses yes. is, uh, you know, it'd be nice. It's it's good to keep, uh, you know, a thesaurus or a dictionary yeah. next to you. It's I I would attribute it to just like reading like um, J.R.R. Tolkien. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing. Like I tried reading those Lord of the Rings books, and yeah. it's it's pretty rough. Like is it is it boring? I've never gotten into it's those. really boring. Like well, the first one in particular. The first like two chapters yeah. is just like here's multiple generational history of the Baggins family. Okay, and it's just there's a lot of that. Like once you meet a new character, it's like mm-hmm. oh, why don't we tell you about their family lineage? And I it's, hear it's, it's like reading a dictionary in the middle of a story. Sure, yeah, and it's it's pretty dry. Um, it's it's. I mean, I read The Hobbit, and I remember mm-hmm. liking The Hobbit, but I even at the time, I remember I read that in like eighth grade. Yeah, I never, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, usually when you get into that kind of stuff, it's uh, it's the people around you that yeah. uh, that will kind of push you to that kind of stuff. But yeah, and if I will say having seen it. the movies, it's mm-hmm. easier. Yeah. But it's because the first book, there's a lot of stuff in that book that's mm-hmm. not in the movies. So like a good chunk of the beginning, it's really slow and it's hard to get through. So I never even finished the first book. Right, it's right. It's just so hard to get there. My buddy, he uh, he definitely got into that, but he told me that he read, um, like almost like a prequel. It's called like the Cimarron. Yeah, or, it's basically like his dictionary or mm-hmm. his encyclopedia of Middle right, Earth, just gods and all kinds of yeah. uh, deities and stuff like yeah. that. So it's always fun to get into that. Yeah, kind of for stuff. me, it's like I like to read the Wikipedia pages because mm-hmm. they're explaining it in a way yeah. I can understand. Yeah, absolutely, and it's, it's kind of the same thing with H.P. Lovecraft. I love reading about all of his stories, but when mm-hmm. you actually sit down and read them, it becomes kind of a test. It, yeah, it is. It's a chore yeah. sitting there trying to just get through there and really throw yourself into the book. So yeah. Um, I know what you mean. One thing interesting to note, though, is that he didn't like as he's held up there as like one of the, these great writers of mm-hmm. our time and everything. He didn't become famous until after he died. Like he was a very shy dude. Yeah. And didn't like what's the word I'm like, uh, not like publicize, um, promote himself. Mm-hmm. He wasn't he was too shy to promote himself. Right. So all of his work was basically kind of put out there after he died so he died poor yeah no and, i i do recall reading up a little bit about that and how yeah i, I think he was uh he had a couple of mental illnesses that yeah kind of he was just kind kept of a him, reclusive guy mm-hmm, that kept him inside so and it's it very much shows in his writing yeah and, yeah and then um like with cthulhu stuff in particular like because cthulhu is always in his stories talking about living in the ocean mm-hmm. and i guess that i was reading listening to this uh, youtube guy today he does this uh explaining the Cthulhu mythos basically and he does a bunch of series of videos on different aspects of the Cthulhu mythos and he was talking about that Cthulhu himself basically came from his own fear of water of the okay. ocean and that's why he you know lives in the ocean and no it's like a that. it's a very cool um 
I guess lore surrounding yeah. the, the entire uh, story and the script. So um, if you know a little bit about uh, Cthulhu and that kind of stuff, you're going to be drawn a lot more into the script and you're going to have yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah. So At the Mountains of Madness, which is the script we're talking about today, is easily my favorite H.P. Lovecraft story, just the whole idea of it. Mm-hmm. And it's I when I heard about this script a long time ago, because it, it was kicked around a while ago. And when Prometheus came out, it was in the news a little more because that was around the time that Gilmiro del Toro, however mm-hmm. the fuck you say his name. I always get corrected on the pronunciation of his name. Guillermo. Guillermo del Toro. There we go. I'm probably going to say it wrong 16 times hey, in the middle of this. you said correction. That's what I'm here for. Yeah, no, that's that's perfect, though. Mm-hmm. Guillermo del Toro, yep. he, he came out after Prometheus came out and was basically like, yeah, I don't think we're going to make the movie because Prometheus was pretty similar to the movie. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about this before you were like very deep into the script. Yep. Now that you finished it, do you see the similarities? Uh, I do. Um, there are parts that uh, there are glaring parts that definitely. Um, yeah. That I see uh, Prometheus took from Mountains of Madness because clearly that came out first. I mean, the well, book. the book did. Of but course. I will say, having read the description of the book, this is, so the scene in particular, Guillermo del Toro, mm-hmm. yeah. said that there was one scene in particular that was almost identical, mm-hmm. and I'm assuming it's the scene where the guy, what's his name? he basically gets turned into a monster mm-hmm. and he comes back and starts killing the crew. Yeah. Just like the scene in Prometheus where the dude gets killed, like the guys in the cave get killed and he gets the black goo on him and then mm-hmm. he comes back and starts just yeah, and killing everybody. Yeah, he's like everybody. upside down. He yeah. looks like a spider basically. Yeah, and to me that was... That was the scene that, that was I read the scene it. I was like, oh, you. this has to be what he was talking okay. about. Okay, all right. Because the, the whole time I was reading it, I was uh, in my mind, I'm thinking about Prometheus. Um, it the same scene that occurred in the first alien yes. where they where they go in i guess they basically go into this cave and they see like this fossilized into uh, the ship yeah, yeah it, the remains of this and, man there the- and honestly i didn't uh, pick up on you know uh, a guy that was possessed for lack of a better word uh, attacking his own crew member i didn't yeah. really pick up on that scene as how i mean that kind of stuff has happened in movies all the time yeah but um, that was the guy's name right i i was always thinking that uh how it was similar to prometheus was when they went down into the uh into the city and they actually saw the hundred foot statue of uh cthulhu i thought that kind of i mean i know it's it's not exactly the same of the the chamber that they open in prometheus right face statue on there exactly that's what it kind of felt like to me so even the whole general tone or uh plot of prometheus is Mm -hmm. they're going to this other planet to find possibly the things that created us right and it's pretty much exactly Mm -hmm. the plot of it i mean the only difference is in Prometheus, they know what they're looking for. Right. This is something they stumble upon. Yeah, it's just they're going on an expedition to Antarctica. Yeah. And they think that, uh, you know, who knows what we'll find up there in the ice buried, yeah. which is, you well, know, it's always fun. Yeah. I mean, because it starts where we, we get introduced to our basically our two main characters, which is the Professor Lake mm-hmm. and uh, what's his name? Dyer. Dyer. Yeah. Dyer. Dyer. Who's a geologist. Mm-hmm. And basically, they're planning this expedition to Antarctica because they found a fossil yeah. of some crazy looking mm-hmm. creature. So you, you don't know what the hell it is. Uh, you know, and it, I believe it's cut in half or it was like, yeah, uh, it's, it's down like the a, middle. It's like a stone slab that's mm-hmm. cut in half and, yep. and on half of imprint is this creature. Right. And so that's where they're going. And but I guess I guess we could start from the very beginning is we have the boat because mm-hmm. this this the way it wraps around in the end is one of my favorite things in the script to talk mm-hmm. about. So we have to talk about the beginning. Sure. So the boat is found drifting in the ocean and yes. it's this giant ship. Uh, I think it's the Mis- Arkham. Yes. Is that the one? Yeah. Because yeah, there's two ships. There's the Arkham and another one. I Miskatonic. Can't yeah, the Miskatonic. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Arkham, it's drifting in the ocean. It's totally wrecked and just it's like a ghost derelict. ship out yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. And they board it and they find this crazy guy just locked in one of the rooms mm-hmm. who attacks these sailors. Yeah. And then we cut to a mental institution where they're kind of holding this guy. Mm-hmm. And then he starts to tell a story, which right. the guy they're holding is dire. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, then we we, we kind of get our opening transition. And one thing that is nice about this script is it's not as hard to read as a Lovecraft story. Yep. Uh, Guillermo. God, I always want to say Gilmiro. Yeah. Do you want to throw in uh, uh, an acronym? Guillermo del GDT. Uh, oh, no, I need no, to get his yeah, name. I need okay. to get his name right. right Guillermo. Go for it. I'm going to stumble yeah, across this. Guillermo until, del Toro. Until it's just fucking ingrained in my I, head. I hear you, buddy. Um, 
Yeah, so we get the early hintings of like how crazy this guy is. He has mm-hmm. dreams about a man. Right. Who I guess we'll talk about it later, but to me that feels unresolved by the end of this. Mm-hmm. Um which in the book it's also unresolved. So I mean, we'll I don't know if you read anything about the book before. No, no. Okay. We'll we'll get there when we get to yeah, the Yeah, I'm I'm strictly script. Yeah. Um mm-hmm. which the script is a very faithful adaptation, but it adds a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Like um, a lot of things are implied in the book because okay. the book is again H.P. Lovecraft. One of the things he does is everything is always told from someone's point of view, either through an interview, a journal, blah, okay. blah, like think World War Z, basically. Gotcha. Um, so, ba- so D- Dyer has a wife, mm-hmm. Anne, and she's pregnant, right? And then, like, we kind of get this little drama of. Lake is basically convincing Dyer to go with him on this expedition, but he's not going to go because his wife is pregnant, and well, that's when he, he shows him. He gives him the choice. Yeah, he gives right. him the choice, mm-hmm. but he shows him the fossil. Exactly, and right. that basically only leaves He tickles one his choice. funny bone a little bit, yeah. Yeah. He's mm-hmm. like, yeah, come on. You know, you can't look at this thing and be like, I'm Gotta not going to f- go. What the fuck is that? Um, one thing I was expecting, because like, the way the script starts with them interviewing Dyer in the mental institution, I thought, and I guess this kind of relates back to the last script we talked about, mm-hmm. I thought it was going to bounce back and forth a lot. Like, yeah, I was, yeah, y- yeah, you're right. I was definitely waiting for, uh, for flashbacks to, uh, to bring you back yeah. uh, to, to, to our main character who's yeah. uh, fucking sitting in a, in a mental institution. Yeah. But it, it really only happens once, like mm-hmm. towards the end. It it reminds me of uh, Titanic. Like she's telling the story. There's yeah. a long chunk of that movie where we don't flash back to like, right. the present, and then you do like right before the ship starts to sink. Yeah, that that's totally cool with me. I yeah. I have no problem with then, uh, with how they do it. Yeah, and I I, I like that. Mm-hmm. I I was expecting more, and I like I was surprised a lot by this script because, as I said, this was one I was anticipating for a long time. Mm-hmm. And was super bummed when it got. Can't, I don't want to say cancel because I guess he's still trying to make right, it. Right. But from the most recent quote I found is he's going to give it one more shot. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. And that's well, kind of let me tell you, I'd, I'd love to see this movie made yeah. because just reading script, um, I haven't read that many scripts, but holy shit, the, the imagery that is on these pages is uh, fascinating. I mean, it, it blows my mind how much detail um, Guillermo and uh, whoever, I know it wasn't just by himself, but someone no, else wrote it with him. one other guy. I'll find that name while you're talking. Right. Uh, I mean, it. I, the things that they are talking about and the way it is written down, you're basically reading a novel uh, that is very simplistic to read because it's in the format of a script. Yeah. It's... I've never had so much fun reading a script. Uh, Matthew Robbins is the other Matthew guy. Robbins. I'm sure he, he's he's incredible as well. Same with Guillermo. So, yeah. um, like I said, I haven't read that many scripts, but uh, this one is a lot of just fun to read because, like I said, I mean, the imagery, it's just tough to picture um, what both writers are, are trying to convey. It's... It's crazy. I mean, yeah. you, you could, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, I will say this is the fav- my favorite script I've read for the show mm-hmm. so far. Yep. Um, it was one I was really anticipating to read. Like, this one just came to me. Somebody, I was kind of like out there searching for scripts and right. I some social media networks. And I'm like, hey, I'm looking for stuff. Does anybody have anything? Mm-hmm. And somebody sent this one to me. I didn't even know this one was out there. So I was pretty fucking excited. A when fan? I heard- not, not a fan. Just well, like, on, it was he, on a, he might be a fan. It was on a Reddit thread. <laughs> okay. So, All right. Um, so yeah, I, I, they have a screenwriting page. I go there every now and then, cool. and I just kind of pluck people for scripts because yeah. they've managed to give me some of this crazy shit that I have just sitting in the backlog, like hey, waiting to pull out. Thank you, anonymous, uh, you know, yeah, person, every, anyone. And I have, I, I do have a couple friends that send me some stuff. Cool, all right, a fan, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, this. So, I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> um, but I w- yeah, I was so excited to read this, and like as I was reading it, I was surprised at how surprised i was getting yeah because i know the story um I've, I've read about it many times and it was just blowing me away the like you said the way he would describe a scene like to me horror is a really hard thing to get right i can't think i love horror movies right but it's really hard for me to find one to be like i love this movie and what it does and for me horror i always like things that have like a deep mythology mm-hmm. and obviously something like hp lovecraft is riddled with deep mythology right um, or something that has like a dark story. Cause like an example is I love the evil dead remake. Yeah. I think that movie is 
for people who shit on remakes and stuff, that movie is highly underrated. It's mm-hmm. fantastic. I really enjoyed that yeah, movie the, as well. The tone and just the way they did it. Mm-hmm. And that's what I pictured, like that kind of thing was what I pictured reading this. Sure. Is like, like a scene jumping ahead a little bit um, when people f- like first start encountering monsters. Uh-huh. So like the first monster that really starts attacking anybody is this thing called the, the Shogoth uh-huh. or the Shogoth. I think yep. that's pronounced, which is basically just this amorphous blob thing that takes on forms. Right. And it lures this dog into the mist. Mm-hmm. And then this guy is looking for the dog and you see it start coming out of the mist. And he describes it's only the front half of the dog yep. like, trailing its entrails, which for one, Really brave to kill a dog in a movie. Yep. That's the one thing That's in a movie true. where you're just like, oh, not the dog. Well, uh, also, what 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 year is it right now? It's in the 30s. It's in the 30s. All right. So yeah. I, I know that, you know, putting it out there right now, sure, dog killing, not a great thing. No. But let's, uh, the 30s, you know, I don't think they gave a shit about the dogs no. back then. No. Well, I mean, the script, the script well, of wasn't course in the not. 30s. I, but, right, right. Um, no, but like that's what they get a movie. You're just like, oh no, they can't kill the dog. Like in Independence Day is always my favorite mm-hmm. example of a dog surviving where right. everything's blowing up, but the dog makes that heroic dog jumps jump, it, yeah, and it's great. Um, but yeah, it's it's really crazy. Just the the horrific scenes he describes, mm-hmm. like even just reading them on the page, sound horrific, and they yeah. don't sound cheesy. I mean, there's one that sounds a little cheesy. We'll get sure, that. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just it's really good the way the horror elements are laid out in the script. Yeah, and that was really like, surprising. I know that uh, there is a lot of suspense to what uh, to what we're talking about here. Yeah, um, but I do feel like a huge part of this movie is gonna end up being like gore, basically. Yeah, um, I mean it's very much reminiscent of the thing. Uh huh. Like, absolutely. Um, I, Again, describing it, it's almost indescribable. Uh, the monsters with tentacles and spider legs yeah, and I, fucking starfish heads. As we were reading this, I told you to just go Google the right. image. I had to Google it because I couldn't contemplate what I couldn't imagine yeah. what Lovecraft is even and talking about. So I read and I read the book up to the point where they introduced the monsters, mm-hmm. which are the ancient ones, which right. are the really crazy, hard to describe ones. Yeah. And th- it's like they basically they look like a cucumber with like tentacles for feet mm-hmm. and wings and tentacles sprouting out the side and like a starfish for a head. Right, right, right. But like trying to read that in the book was like I have no idea what they're talking about. It, it's the same thing when I'm I'm sitting here reading the script and I'm trying to visualize it on what uh, uh, a movie screen. Yeah, and I'm thinking to myself like I. It could come out extremely campy and, yeah, and kind absolutely. of uh, you know almost uh, laughable. Yeah, but it's, um, it's kind of weird that as as good as the mythology mm-hmm. that Lovecraft has created, he created some really wacky looking monsters. Yeah, I think it had to do with uh, his his time, uh, you know, in the what turn of the century, basically. Yeah, and the man had an incredible imagination, and he's also terrified of the ocean. You said, yeah. So he's bringing together octopuses, tentacles, yeah. uh, starfish head, any anything that really very aquatic. Yeah, and, gives and him vegetative. Uh, gives him the heebie-jeebies. He's going to throw it in his uh, yeah. in his book. And it, it definitely like you look at the pictures of these things, and it sounds like the Shogoth. That's easy to imagine, mm-hmm. just a fucking blob that takes the form of things, right? Um, but yeah, like the elder things and even Cthulhu himself, there's tons of pictures. Like I'm glad there's people out there smarter than me that can pick apart these descriptions and draw an artist no, rendition totally. of it. I mean, um, yeah, I'm looking at one here and I couldn't describe this to you. Uh, no. I mean, if, if you want to, that, that's, that's the, the show. show goth. Goth. Yeah, that's the show. I mean, goth. yeah, this, uh, it's got like 9,000 eyes. It's just like a purple blob. It's mm-hmm. uh, two legs. Tentacles, tentacles. coming out yeah. of its back. But like, even in the script, when the show goth appears, it's like, he's absorbing people mm-hmm. and people are like coming out of him. Right. Which, and speaking. Yeah. yeah which is faces awesome. Appear. Like, yeah. There were so many scenes that, like, I want this to be a movie so fucking bad mm-hmm. just because I want to see these scenes. Because, like, when, um, I mean, we're kind of jumping all over the place. Right. But, well, I mean, uh, the, the story is pretty simple. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I, we said, it's very similar to Prometheus. They right. go to Antarctica, they're doing some digging, and they stumble across some really bad shit. It's mm-hmm. kind of like your basic story. Right. Um, the Mountains of Madness part comes in a little later. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, it's like... 
I keep fucking losing my train of thought here. Oh, oh, when he's talking to him, like those are some of my favorite scenes in the script. Mm-hmm. Like Lake, he eventually gets absorbed by the Shogoth, and basically right. they can take the form of anything they seem to touch or right. absorb, mm-hmm. and and they can also multiply because yeah. there's like a scene later on where because they're harmed by like salt, mm-hmm. the, the like. salt water is yeah, what so, uh, kills them. Yeah, so they have them like is is the Shogoths or the Elder things that are in this in the. In the, uh, in the like the sarcophagus is underwater. I think it's the uh, the elder things yeah, or, so or the old to... ones. Yeah. So does water affect them as well? No, I don't think so because they were the in like right? those. Uh, well, I'm. I think the water affects everyone, but they were like in those yeah. like uh, uh, sarcophaguses. Yeah. And then when they crack them open. The fucking green goose starts flying out. You know. Uh, yeah, I think it. Was, they said there's like minerals and stuff in the water mm-hmm. that keeps them in like a hibernating state. Right. And they're okay. <laughs> We're kind of all over the place. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean the the beginning of the script. It's a little slow. Mm-hmm. It's definitely building up. Right. Because I, I know the story, so I'm like, I just want him to get to the city. That's what I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. And because the whole the whole thing is they go there and. They do this interesting thing, which I don't think is in the book, but the time dilation stuff. Mm -hmm. So they get to Antarctica, and it's basically they're stuck in a fog, Mm -hmm. and that fog ends up causing them to wreck. And then they set up a camp, and um, as they're setting up a camp is when they start, they find these sarcophaguses. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the ice on the ship, I love the way they describe this. They're trying to melt the ice off the ship, but it's like almost growing back. Right. And then later we find out it's because there's like a time dilation going on that time just seems to be moving very quickly and it's they don't know it themselves but Mm -hmm. like there's good examples of like oh the plane goes flying and it's only flying for like 30 minutes but all of a sudden it's out of fuel right they they look at their watches watches are all stopped exactly at At the the same same time time. and you know uh no, no one knows what to do with themselves in this situation. There's a lot of, I mean, yeah. these are all scientists on board. Yeah, and, and once they get there, it's just like a fucking cluster. Yeah, they, you know, they've never uh, come across any fucking uh, uh, time uh, paradoxes and things that are yeah. stopping. You know, they they tried to think of it as. Uh, issues with the earth's magnetic field that would be causing this yeah but you know i mean clearly it's not the earth's <laughs> magnetic field yeah um so they set up their base camp and then they have a guy who's like he basically goes under the water to kind of check out mm-hmm. the hull of the ship right and that's where we find these Was sarcophag- that larson yeah okay and that's where we find these sarcophaguses mm-hmm. that are under the water right and they pull them out and they crack them open and they find the creatures that mm-hmm. they have the fossil of which right are the elder things which are crazy cucumber monsters that we've been describing yeah um and that's that's a really fucking cool like idea mm-hmm. like and they they basically describe later that they're under there to preserve them like because there was a war between the elder ones and the, sh- the shogoths were basically mm-hmm. their slaves like we find all this out later, but the Shogos monsters were their slaves, and they started to uprise. And so these elder things that were still alive basically hid under the water, and this these sarcophaguses were keeping them in hibernation, keeping them alive. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, th- like this is where shit starts just to kind of go bad. So this is where we get the scene with the dog, right? We, and we find the penguins. What did you think of like the whole penguin thing? Like, uh, did you pick up on what it was? I don't remember if they say it in the script what they were used for, but did you? No, I I don't think I picked up on it. Um, I was <laughs> the description. Um, basically, they they say that these are eight foot tall penguins, albino, albino, uh, blind, blind. Uh, that have like cataracts in their eyes. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I'm just picturing just like, like this glossy, there. right? And they're just, first of all, fucking eight foot penguin. That sounds uh, so crazy. That is so big. I, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying. Yeah, to, I'm like five ten. <laughs> yeah, I'm like five five over here, and I'm trying to just uh, picture a penguin that huge. Yeah. Um, you It'd know, be like that stack of boxes right next to us. I don't know if uh, we can see this. But no, well, of course not. But I mean, it's it's fucking, it's terrifying tired. to think of a. I mean, it's probably dwarfs and ostrich. Oh yeah, absolutely. I've hey. been next to an ostrich. Ostriches are probably like six five. Okay, maybe. I mean, I'm sure there's bigger ones. <laughs> no, of course, yeah. Um, but uh, no, I I didn't really pick up on uh, on what the purpose of the penguins were. They so basically they're livestock. Mm-hmm. They're food for the elder things. Got it. So they were basically created to just kind of be there. That's why they're blind. That makes they, sense. Yeah. And how they talk about how they all stare in the same direction mm-hmm. and they're basically just drawn to stuff. Yeah. They're basically kept there as livestock. Yeah. That makes sense. And I love how they talk about how 
they're they're killing them for food and how mm-hmm. they just smell terrible and he just like is throwing up at the idea of eating them <laughs> yeah i i remember that part that's uh that, that was pretty good when they uh well i mean again we're jumping ahead but when he jumps into the ice cave and uh he larson tells dyer to to keep his mouth closed because he, yeah he, they're they the eight foot penguin shows up behind him and he screams like a <laughs> yeah. like a girl i mean but, well yeah well, who else wouldn't i mean i'd fucking scream like that but, they sound um, creepy. Like, yeah, no, that's what like I'm they saying. Sound, they sound totally harmless, but just the idea of seeing something like that would be oh, very Oh, yeah. Unsettling. Wake up in the middle of the night. That fucker is at the foot of my bed. I yeah. mean, yeah, he's harmless, but, uh, you know, there's, <laughs> there's no fucking joke. Yeah. Um, so Gunnarsson, basically, be- he's the one who's out hunting. Mm-hmm. He basically becomes the main antagonist of the story. Right. Because right. he becomes an alien. Right. Which, and he starts multiplying. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they're out hunting the penguins and Mm -hmm. that's when we get this dog scene, which is like literally you came and talked to me about it. I'm like, man, that was really horrific. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. it it painted such a picture in my brain and I've never seen anything like that in a movie. Um, it sounded a little ridiculous because I can't imagine a dog because the way he described it almost like it was walking like normal, but it's like if a dog is only happy, he's going to be dragging pretty hard. Yeah. It's yeah. Continue. I mean, it's kind of fucked up, but yeah, go Um, on. But yeah, we get a little in the in Larson. So wait, which one? Gunnarsson. Yeah, Gunnarsson is the one who becomes the monster. So he's out hunting with Larson, mm-hmm. and Larson is the one who escapes. Right, he's the one that jumps into the water to uh, after which, something kind of. Uh, I was like, wouldn't he freeze to death? One hundred percent. I said the same thing. I these guys are in the fucking Arctic right now. The. The second he hops in the water, he's yeah. he's fucked. So Gunnarsson, yeah, he gets killed and mm-hmm. basically turned into a shogun. Right. And, yeah, he goes chasing after Larson. Larson shoots a hole into the ice mm-hmm. with the shotgun, which I'm sure the ice in Antarctica is a little too thick for that. <laughs> um, and, yeah, and he he dives in. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, immediately I was like, oh, well, he's dead. And right, they, and they said that he fucking just fell down like a rock into yeah. the darkness. I'm like, yeah. oh, there, there goes he Larson. Ends, he ends up showing up later just mm-hmm. fine. Of course. Yeah, I'm like, this dude would have had a hypothermia in seconds. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, a little suspension of this. I mean, we're reading a script full of gods and monsters, so yeah. it's... Spider Sus- monsters. Yeah, suspension and of disbelief fucking... is pretty easy. Yeah, that's where the <laughs> CG comes in. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, there's definitely a couple moments of like, oh, I don't know if anybody would survive that. Mm-hmm. Um, did you catch the mention multiple times of the Necronomicon? Yeah, that was uh, that was pretty cool. Just to uh, have that jump in there, lore yeah. from a different. Uh, I don't I don't know if it is Lovecraft. Is Lovecraft it? wrote a story called the uh, Necronomicon. Wow, and there the you nec- go. It's basically as it is described in this. It's the history and information on some of these creatures right. and like Cthulhu and stuff like that. And a lot of the scientists were basically scoffing. It's, at, it's uh, basically like in the lore of the, like the guy it's, it was written by a dude uh-huh. and everybody just assumes that he was crazy and a whack job and it's all fake. Mm-hmm. And even professor Lake, who's the one who ends up taking it. Mm-hmm. Um, even he kind of scoffs at it as well. But then once they start to encounter things, he's like, look, what other fucking explanation would right. you have? We're going to need like, this fucking book. Yeah. Like if this thing even has any idea of what's going on now, is it, does it feel like the same kind of Necronomicon from Evil Dead? I don't think so. I mean, yeah. to me, completely the, different. One? Yeah. To me, it does. Okay. Um, Cause to me, it just seems like a book written by a, a person. Whereas okay. the Necronomicon in uh, Evil Dead is basically implied to be a book by demons. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, it just seems like some, I, I, I don't know much about that story, mm-hmm. maybe, but like where this guy got this information and stuff. Right. Like that. Right. But, um, I don't know. Maybe it's just, it's just this this guy got this information somewhere and wrote yeah, this book. Yeah, I mean, it's a mythological book, you know. Yeah. It's jumped into different movies, so. And as I said before, it's it's a th- running theme in the Lovecraft stories is, mm-hmm. like, forbidden knowledge. Of course, yeah. Just, like, all of this kind of... It's, it's always about a story about a guy who is somehow learning all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, this story is about Dyer and encountering this ancient civilization, or this story is about the guy who wrote this Necronomicon. And there's stuff like that all over H.P. Lovecraft's work and the cthulhu mythos is kind of like how we have an expanded universe in movies now it's like the marvel movies of horror stories it right, all connects right. together mm-hmm. um and it's nice to see that there is a lot of there's a lot of things thrown in in this script just like there would be like in those movies like hey we're gonna reference the necronomicon like i love stuff like that yeah no that, that's always uh fun to get you get other stories thrown into the script so yeah i i was always i was definitely uh having a good time when i read that yeah um so one of my favorite 
parts of um, the the out, uh, at the Mountains of Madness mm-hmm. story is the idea of the city. Um, and to me, that was the point I was like building up to for this whole script. I'm like, when do they get to the city? Is it going to be the same as the yep. book and stuff like that? Because I didn't get this far in the book, but from what I read on Wikipedia, um, it's basically they get there and they're exploring and they don't really seem to encounter anything okay. and, until they're leaving. Um, and in this, it's like they get there and shit kind of just starts attacking it, like, mm-hmm. a, like a Shogoth or whatever. Is they play a much bigger role in this script than they ever did in the story. Definitely. In, in the script, there are multiple Shogoths that attack them at different places, different times. Yeah. <clears throat> in the story, there's just one that chases them at the end, and I don't think it actually kills anybody. Well, you know, it's a horror movie, so yeah. you're going to need a little bit more yeah. suspense there's, than one. And there's a lot of deaths in this. Yeah. Because, um, Everybody fucking yeah. dies. So basically two teams... Like kind of separate. So Dyer was gonna go with them to mm-hmm. the city because they see they're at this mountain range and it's you know the mountains of madness and they see that what looks like buildings like cresting over the top of this mm-hmm. mountain range. So they take these two planes and they fly up there and one of them crashes, the other one lands. Mm-hmm. And I think you would. Did you mention something about how you felt about the plane crash at one point? Uh, I, w- I was blown away that uh, anyone is. First of all, I don't know how these guys are uh, taking off. Um, on on an ice uh, covered. I mean, I think they just. I mean, Antarctica. It's got a lot of flat areas, just because okay. it is ice. I think right. it's just implied that they're just okay. using the flat right. ice. Well, then beyond that, I don't. Uh, I these don't, are these I are, don't are smaller. Like that. these are smaller, like single engine. Right. Planes. No, of course. Yeah, that I understand. But um, yeah, what what were you uh, going on? Um, just. I do like how the crash is described as being pretty horrific, mm-hmm. and it's like, oh, well, it just sounds like all those people are dead because like the plane flips and like the top of it smashes. Yeah, into something. I remember now. And like, I think only one person dies in the crash. Right, they else just you know get up, uh, wipe themselves off, you know, brush some snow yeah. off, and they just uh, make way for the city. Well, they basically just make camp mm-hmm. right there, and then it's like, and then they wake up like, oh, well, we just got to go back. Like we got here, but now we got to go back. Right, and it's like, why'd you go all the way up there if you're not even going to check it out? But um, obviously, they only have one plane now, so they can't take everybody back. At right, once. right. And then they try to go back. It, well, they drew straws uh, yeah. to to see who was going to go back. There was a uh, and Lake was originally going to go back, but mm-hmm. he elects to stay because there's these two brothers, and right. they don't want to be separated. So he's like, "Yeah, you can take mine." And the dude's like, "Look, I know you want to stay." Mm-hmm. And then you know everything about it just kind of feels like the thing. Just the uh, how much, how yeah. every character is a male. Um, in the movie and uh which i would assume would change well, if the, the movie one was female, made there's the one female character who dies which is his wife which okay. that's why oh, yeah right that's why he doesn't go my with. apologies yeah oh no that's fine that's why lake or uh dyer i mean doesn't go with up to the city because mm-hmm. lake invites him but he's like and this just seemed like really poor timing on his part he's like right. hey look i got a telegram earlier why don't you go check that out before we go on? Right, thing? right. If you wanted the guy to help you, why would you tell him right there and then? Yeah, I don't. Want, I mean, that's that's your info now. I mean, yeah. you could do whatever you want with it. Yeah. So if he tells him about this telegram he received, which is that his wife and child both died during mm-hmm. childbirth, which right. is the most depressing thing. <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> rough. <laughs> the most depressing. Now I'm, I'm stuck get. on a fucking frozen uh, hell hole. Fro- yeah, frozen boat in the middle of fucking Antarctica. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so them being in the city is is very much how you said like Prometheus, like mm-hmm. when they go into the room right. with the statue, and it's one thing that it, I like that movie so much for because I I think a lot of people shit on that movie. I fucking love that movie. No, it's a good movie. I liked um, it, and I'm so excited for this mm-hmm. new one. But um, yeah, like I love that part. The whole opening like middle of that movie. End of this is just like, oh, let's check out this place and what's the mystery of it? Sure. Just the drive of that mystery. It's a very simple story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All you want to do, you want to find out what the fuck is going on in this yeah. place that no one's ever been to. Yeah. And uh, see what happens. Um, the one thing I struggle with is when they're in the city, mm-hmm. the only way they can really tell a story is they're literally just basically like reading cave paintings. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, I remember that. And even in the book, I'm like, oh, that seems like a little lame. Mm hmm. Um, it, they do improve it a little bit in the movie, though, because as they're exploring the city, they basically find like the center of the city. Right. It's like, this is where the time dilation is coming from. There's some power source there that's mm-hmm. causing it. 
and he touches like a control console or something, and he basically gets a flash of their history. Right. And to me, that was like a kind of an improvement on the story because it's like, I mean, it's it's it is kind of like a cheap trick we've seen in a lot sure, of movies sure. before, but it works. Yeah. And it's done really well, and I like that idea of he's just flooded with all this knowledge now. So in the book he's uh they're basically reading hieroglyphics yeah okay and, and it is as such in the script as well right yeah I, but but, but he gets know. more information once he interacts exactly with that console and i think it is interesting to bring up that um when they are going through the city and they stumble i mean i don't know if they're going into buildings but they stumbled into this room that had basically skeletons of all life yeah so it's heavily implied that, I mean, mm-hmm. and this is what he says, is basically these winged cucumber-like creatures, the uh-huh. ancient ones, they came to Earth and they created life. Right. And it's implied that they created us. Mm-hmm. And again, similar to Prometheus, they're going there and the engineers, they mm-hmm. created us. Except they're humanoid in their own appearance. Right. And then out of boredom, the old ones gave us uh, pride, greed, yeah. all these other things just to yeah. f- see us fucking tear each other apart. Yeah. Which becomes one of my favorite moments is when Lake comes face to f- or no, it's who's the really religious one? I oh, think I have uh, a note of Atwood? that. Atwood? Yeah, Atwood. Uh-huh. Uh, my favorite scene. So eventually um, Lake gets mm-hmm. absorbed by a I, Yeah, they, I know where you're going with this. Yeah, I enjoyed it too. Yeah. The scene where Atwood, what, this is a little later. Mm-hmm. We still got some more to cover. But Atwood, he's... Go, he, they're, it's like kind of towards the part where they're trying to escape. And he's like, oh, I need to go grab something. Mm-hmm. And he's basically going back for his Bible. Right. And yeah, the scene where a Shogoth appears as Lake and is talking to Atwood, basically taunting him. Yep. And like, you hold on to that Bible and your beliefs and everything. And he's just like, we created you and we gave you all this. And mm-hmm. he's basically just laughing in his face. At right. Him. While Atwood is uh, yeah. reciting uh, prayers, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's by far my favorite moment in the script. Yeah. It was- it's very, it, th- there's a lot of very cool uh, scenes that go on in the movie. Yeah. A, a, and just like the dialogue in that moment, mm-hmm. like he's really ripping this guy's beliefs to shreds. Yeah. And the guy, I imagine, imagine he's crying you know basically looking at yeah. uh, at someone a colleague of his that he now knows is some kind of fucking demon monster in, yeah. inside of him so i mean that, that's got to be some terrifying shit yeah and oh, i just love that scene um but jumping back a little bit so mm-hmm. while they're in the city um dire is with a team in like on their base camp mm-hmm. and this is where shit kind of starts to go bad in a different way because they're checking out some of the ancient ones that they pulled out of the sarcophagus right. and they start to come back alive because yeah. they're they're not being sedated anymore what basically. else would they be doing huh? yeah and this is one of the scenes that i think is kind of a little ridiculous mm-hmm. so while those things are coming alive they start killing people uh the shogoth version of Gunnarsson mm-hmm. has been dis- okay. This is confusing me because they, they describe his skin as being white and translucent, but nobody ever seems to mention it. So I can't tell if he's like that all the time, or uh-huh. maybe it shifts like that. And because they like basically put him in the medical wing, like oh he's hurt, and let's put him in there, right? And then he just starts absorbing everybody and killing everybody. And I lo- so I love the idea. So uh, Dyer's hanging out with one of the other guys. I can't remember which one, and. He, they're like checking out the examination room and then all of a sudden Dyer can't find his buddy and he goes in and the ancient ones are awake and they're basically dissecting him on a table yep, yep. which i thought was a little ridiculous no i i for some reason i just see it perfectly clear i mean uh it's terrifying yeah you know no. just giant fucking tentacle monsters ripping your buddy like, apart i love the idea of him being ripped apart but the way it's described it's almost like they stopped to have a scientific examination yeah like and, why right then and there yeah <laughs> like, that is uh you got yeah you have a point there i yeah. mean there's a lot of shit going on like, and you be, got humans who yeah. you haven't seen in forever yeah like, now's be, the time and it's like why are they dissecting them if they created them they already know all about them you know yeah I mean, it, it's just the way it's described maybe uh-huh. that's not the way it was intended no, but absolutely i got it's you. basically like they have him i think the literal dialogue is they have him on a table performing an autopsy of their own of, or yeah something like yeah that. I, I remember that yeah which them ripping him open is great and i also like the scene because there's a scene where they describe and it's the first kind of scene where they hint at like some real horror in the script because mm-hmm. this happens a little earlier than some of the other stuff we mentioned is um i think it's dyer's or maybe it's the guy they rip open he's like they show that like he's in a room and behind him on the autopsy tables are all these like dead supposedly 
uh, sh- uh, ancient ones. Uh-huh. And then it's like a scene where he moves and the camera's supposed to move with him, I guess. And then when we come back, they're all standing up behind him and yeah. he doesn't know. It feels like Independence Day, basically, yeah. where the finger is moving. Yeah. And then <laughs> but like, everyone's fucked. As cheesy as a lot of these moments could be, yeah. I think they're all written really well. And like, like you said, it, you can visualize it. It really bounces off the page. Again, the imagery is fucking awesome. It, yeah. It's it's a, this is a lot of fun to read. I mean, I had a lot of fun reading Batman uh, year, one. year one, and you know because I enjoy the Batman. Yeah. But um, something that I've never uh, read about before or really knew the history of for uh, this H.P. Lovecraft, this was fucking amazing this yeah uh, the script is just a lot of fun to read and uh it's a quick read so yeah it's, it's only like 108 pages right. which is pretty average for a script length mm-hmm. but like this movie seems like something that could be a big blockbuster um i don't know if it'd be a summer movie it feels more like an october movie but um i was surprised at how quick it moved yeah like it, as as much as it builds up in the mm-hmm. beginning it's not like boring build up right like, all the characters are really interesting they're mm-hmm. all really well written and yeah this is like i said this, this is the best script i've read for the show i think no I, um, I agree and i love how they have a way to fight them because they know that the salt hurts mm-hmm. them because when right uh was it larson yeah dove into the water and the shogoth tried to get him it like melted from the water right basically. it tried to throw its yeah. tentacle in there and so then it pulled out he started they have all these shotguns mm-hmm. and because they're hunting you know they right. need f- hunting um and so, how many would you say he's got like maybe they make eight, it sound nine? like he's strapped with yeah, like at he's least got like, 10 yeah the, here here's one for your hand yeah. two for your back and just make sure it's filled with fucking salt like, it reminded me of one of those old pc games like doom mm-hmm. where you're like your dude sure. you have nine weapons there's no you, way i could carry so many weapons you just picture a guy carrying a chainsaw minigun mm-hmm. and rocket launcher at the same totally, time totally. they literally described him as he's just strapped with chainsaws right or, and uh, he's sorry, cutting down shotguns. his uh, shotguns yeah. to, to make yeah. him sawed off. Like, I'm sorry, you can saw him off all you want. You're still carrying, like, ten guns. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, so they start... Um, he puts salt in the bullets, mm-hmm. which is brilliant. Like, yeah, oh, yeah. Like, I, I, and even when he was, like, they were describing the scene, I'm like, what the fuck is this guy doing? And then he shot one. I'm like, oh, yeah, the salt hurts them. Where did they get the salt? I assume it's just something they had. Okay. I mean, you know, it's... Salt breaks down ice anyway, yeah, so it, I assume they had a yeah, fuck time. I, yeah, I don't think they really just. Dis- they say he went back like as so like. Oh, I forgot one scene that it's really fun. Um, so after the dude was like filleted on the table, uh-huh. Dyer starts running away. Right, and the ancient ones chase him, and he runs right into the Shogoth, and the Shogoth and the ancient ones, mortal enemies. They see each other and they start attacking each other. Yeah, when I uh, when I read that part. And, you know, he's frightened, sees his buddy on the slab, and he starts running. I was blown away by the fact that they said that Shogoths are flying through the air. They are now, uh, there are people's faces that are fused into these... I don't know these fucking purple blob monsters. Yeah, uh, just screaming as he. I. It's just insanity is happening as he's running through. Uh, just I assume just white uh, snow everywhere. Yeah, well, people are just fighting each and other. And like as confusing as something like a f- amorphous blob monster could be, they managed to make it pretty comprehensible. <laughs> um, and like the sea so. Carrying on with the Shogoth after, uh-huh. so Dyer and Larson end up escaping into a cave, and that's where he's loading up on the guns with the salt right. and everything. And they're basically like, we need to get some rest. And Larson's been in there for a while. Yeah, he said he like Stocking while everything up. was going on, mm-hmm. he went back to one of the other ships and got some supplies. Right after he swam out of the uh, yeah. fro- frozen fucking we water. Have no idea how he didn't get right. Out of right, him, and yeah. he's fine. He's in an ice cave now. Yeah, perfectly fucking warm. Yeah, no, it's amazing. <laughs> There's no wind in here, so we're. Good. I tell you, the Definitely. fucking the men of the 20s and 30s. Oh, the, these yeah. were real men. We got nothing on them mm-hmm. um but yeah so as this going on the, the other plane is coming back right and they don't know what's been going on mm-hmm. so because they've been up there they have no communication and so i love the scene where they land and gunnerson just comes out to meet them and it's just this fucking blob monster just swarms this plane yeah and it's just taking these guys one by one no uh, uh, going on about that scene was uh gunnerson what he uh, he split himself into maybe fifteen into like different fi- guys, uh, like fifteen 50 different Gunnersons. Gunnersons, right? Fifteen clones of himself, 
and these guys are in <laughs> they uh seem like kind of like not oh like yeah him. there's uh there's gunnerson uh well i know that guy let him bring him over closer yeah. and then when they realize that there's 15 fucking clones that are now getting closer to the windows uh, this scene was incredible really scared the shit out of me when one of the Gunnersons presses his face up into the yeah. window and they all start like laughing at the same oh, time yeah. with this high pitched fucking like alien laugh. Incredible. It was, I, it was yeah, awesome. I just love the way the monsters like taunt the humans. Mm-hmm. It, it felt a lot like uh, in the thing where they were about to kill the one guy with the flamethrowers and he opens up his mouth and he makes yeah. that one insane noise. Yeah. That's what it kind of felt like to me, except these guys are uh, smiling and, and they're fucking, um, they're very uh, what? What am I looking for here? They're very uh, just insane looking, yeah, I guess, for I mean, lack of a better word. It's basically just like being sworn by crazy people who happen to be morphing blob monsters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, did you ever see the remake of the thing or like the remake prequel? Uh, with with the girl. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I saw. Yeah, I saw it. Was I it? guess it wasn't too uh, too memorable. Uh, yeah. Beyond I have, that, I haven't seen it. I kind of want to check it out. It's all right. I mean, I, I remember I told I read you the uh, the possible remake of the thing. Yeah, or no, the sequel. Like it was. A, yeah, it was for, a sequel, and it was one. it was what maybe like fifteen pages. It was, was just like a, a treatment, treatment, a treatment yeah. for it. So not great. Um, and not at all like the original. Right. Yeah. Nothing like that. But uh, it, it it wasn't like it was some weird. other alien came down and is like tried to help out yeah. the Brady. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was i don't oh, i don't think it'll weird. get made but yeah uh, no stay away from that one <laughs> um but yeah so this uh, at this point it kind of becomes an action movie mm-hmm. um and this is like they just start like gunning down shogos as they're trying to get away right um i'm trying to remember because they end up on the boat and i'm trying to remember how they end up on the boat well uh they let's see what they tried to put charges down in the crevasses oh okay yeah so they they get on the boat to, and they get the tnt because mm-hmm. And they only have like so much of it because of the time that's gone by. Yeah, because mm-hmm. the thing is, they think the the monsters are going to fix the boat and take that back to the mainland. And right, then it's fucking game over, human race. Right. So their idea is they're going to, it's it's on like a shifting plate, and they're going to line that um what's it called the fault the uh-huh. fault line right with uh, TNT and blow it and mm-hmm. then basically trap them there. Yeah. And uh, I do love the scene. So it's it's basically at this point it's Atwood Larson. Uh, Dyer and like one other guy I think Mm -hmm. and um, like as this is going on all those guys basically get killed except for Dyer Mm -hmm. Um, because one of them ends up getting turned into a Shogoth I think and it it almost seemed like they kind of knew he was but they're like we're just gonna roll with it for a minute Mm -hmm. or maybe I was reading that wrong but it definitely seemed like they had an idea that Atwood was a Shogoth yeah I thought you know what you're right about that because uh, what he um because it was after he, he had the conversation with Lake, and yeah. Lake's not going to just let him fucking go no, without they, assimilating with and him. And they said that there was a gunshot, mm-hmm. but you don't know the re- the resolution to that gunshot. And then Atwood is... And then Atwood comes out, and he's like, yeah, I just had to get my Bible. Did we see Lake after? No, we never saw Lake So again. he killed Lake, potentially? Potentially, or Lake got to him, and that Shogoth just never kind of reappeared. Okay. Um, yeah, and it's not really made clear, but I mean, I guess it is made clear because he, he is one later. Like once they, Mm -hmm. before they go to blow the TNT, he try to interferes and, uh, Larson basically like sacrifices him like, or I guess he doesn't say, cause he ends up on the boat. This part got a little muddy for me. Yeah. Um, basically then they end up blowing out the dynamite. Right. And at this point I just have a note that says, man, the script is awesome. (laughs) Um, and then I fucking love the way this ends so much. Um, I will say in the original script or in the original book, I mean story, Cthulhu does not appear. Okay. Um, but in this, you straight up get they blow up the plate, the ship comes loose, they get onto the ship, and they're like kind of leaving, and then Cthulhu just rises. Yeah, down, I remember that shit. Fucking reaches down and he's like a giant, reaches down, grabs the ship, and mm-hmm. just hurls it. Yeah, well, no, he uh, didn't he break it in half like an egg or something, they said? I think said? he kind of crushes it as he grabs it in okay. such a situation and then hurls the chunk that they're in. And then it literally plays into the beginning. Right. Like, because the ship's all fucked up. It drifts into the water. and then But they're playing it from Dyer's point of view this time. Because mm-hmm. the opening of the script is from the sailor's point of view. They open this door. This crazy guy kills one of these sailors with an right. axe to the chest. But... And this ver- at the end, it's from Dyer's point of view, and he's like, "There's monsters beating on the other side of the door," and they open the door, and he assumes they're Shogoths, and he kills the guy. Right, right. And it's like cut to black because he gets knocked out or whatever. Right. 
and that's, it's fucking awesome. No, it's uh, it's it's pretty sweet the way it was. Uh, it was definitely laid out for you there. Then they had him. They they came back after uh, Cthulhu throws him into the ocean. I guess out of the uh, the time portal area that they were stuck yeah. in. So he throws them out of there, and while he's actually cracking them, all of his uh, little homies are falling into the water and just dying, yeah. disintegrating. So, yeah. I, you know, he's a god. He doesn't really give a shit. No, so. and I want to say in the Cthulhu mythos that, like, a lot, of, like, I think the ancient ones were at war with Cthulhu. Mm-hmm. Like, see, that's the thing. It doesn't make sense for Cthulhu to actually appear in the script. I think it's just something thrown in because, hey, we're doing a script that's touching on the Cthulhu mythos. Yeah, we if have it's to HP, have we got to have it in yeah. there. Yeah. Um, in which they talk about seeing a statue of him in the mm-hmm. city. Yeah, 100 foot tall statue that yeah. they all uh, worship. But from what I understand, Cthulhu is basically in this underwater city, like hibernating. And he reaches yeah. out to people mentally and he creates the cult of Cthulhu because he's like influencing people through their sure. dreams and i mean this is like three different stories i'm talking about now no i've actually but, um, uh no not now that you mentioned that i actually recently watched a uh another uh another movie that was based on the cthulhu uh mythos but um there there are quite a few it adaptations was, it was fucking brutal it was uh uh dragon yeah, Dagon. Dagon? Yeah, yeah, that was that was one that was inspired by one of his mm-hmm. stories. Yeah. There Who's is actually crap. So <laughs> um there's actually a in two thousand and five, they made a silent film and they filmed it just like they would film a silent film in the twenties uh-huh. called The Call of Cthulhu, based on the story The Call sure, of Cthulhu, sure. which yeah. is about the cult of Cthulhu. Right. And yeah, apparently it's very good. I haven't seen it, but it, it apparently it re- reviewed very well. It was made in what two thousand and five. Okay. And they made a straight up silent movie that it looks like a movie from the twenties. Like they use filmmaking techniques to mimic the look of a twenties movie. To the, oh, well, I'm, I'd love to check it out. And yeah, there's also a movie just called Cthulhu that has, I don't even know. It's, it's kind of unrelated. No, but I, is, I hear you. It is base. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, listen, Lovecraft, uh, ever, ever since he died, he's become extremely popular. Yes. So I mean, For he, a dark twisted man. <laughs> yeah, um, his uh, a lot of his stuff is, is pretty amazing. But uh, yeah. like we said, it's uh, it's not easy to read. No, it's definitely something that like I like reading uh, the summaries of it. Something that can give me mm-hmm. more information. Like I'd love to be able to go and read all these, but I, it's hard to find the time and of the patience. No, I, I hear um, you. So we we do have a little tag at the end of the script here, mm-hmm. um, and this so this is something in the story that is a little so throughout the script at three different points I think it is Dyer's having dreams about this dark man. They right, refer to him as the dark man, and so he's telling this story to this other guy. I, don't, I can't remember his name, but he's Ooh, the guy at the end. Yeah, uh, in the, in, he, yeah, he's some kind of captain. Yeah, he's just like some ship captain guy, mm-hmm. and he's the one that um, is telling he's telling the story to. Right, right. He is going to be going yeah. off to and he, Antarctica, and, and Dyer's trying to tell him, "Don't go there. This right. is what happened to us." Mm-hmm. Which is how the setup of the story is. It's Dyer. I think he's writing a letter or something to a newspaper or something, just trying right, to get right. out, like, "Hey, this is what happened to us in Antarctica. Don't go there." And this takes it in a little more extreme. Uh, territory because by putting him in a mental institution and all that but um yeah it, and it ends with like oh yeah fuck it that guy's crazy we're gonna go mm-hmm. anyway oh no he says that you killed you killed everyone on yeah, your he's crew just, he's just like oh you went crazy and you yeah. killed them all i don't i don't need a fucking reason to fucking yeah. lock you up dude yeah and so th- unfortunately for dyer no well he's uh safe in a mental institution <laughs> yeah. now but i mean they as they're approaching antarctica mm-hmm. they say that he killed himself oh yeah yeah he was is, uh hang, he hung himself yeah, he hung yep. himself, which is something that was not in the original thing. okay so in the original thing because in this he escapes with larson but larson is basically infected okay and he kills him in the ship mm-hmm. like in their half of the ship that cthulhu hushed sure. across the <laughs> yeah. ocean that's just floating uh, yeah. yeah um and so in the original script they escaped, uh, I think it was Dyer and Larson, and Larson looked back at the city as they were escaping, mm-hmm. and he saw something. They never tell you what he saw, but they say he went crazy afterwards. And After just, he saw yeah, it? Yeah, and ne- like, he saw something so horrific that he just never, like, he just went insane. Now, this is in the book. Yes, this is in the story. Okay. Because in the script, Larson is killed by Dyer when they when they get there he's mm-hmm. like i'm gonna become one of them like right. i want to die on my own terms basically um 
So throughout the script, Dyer is plagued by the dreams of this dark man. Mm -hmm. And I assume that's what this dark man is supposed to be. I don't know if the script is implying that he's like a manifestation of Cthulhu. Maybe, like I said, through the dream. Actually, now that I'm saying that out loud, it's probably through Cthulhu's dreams Uh or the way he communicates with people. Um, So maybe that was some influence from Cthulhu. Yeah. But at the end of the script, this captain guy, they, they go to Antarctica. They find their base camp and it's all destroyed. Right. And then all of a sudden, all of his crew just disappears. And I love the way I love the way this is written because mm-hmm. um, it's literally just like in a second. It's almost dreamlike. Yeah. It's like he sees the camp and then basically he turns around and all of his men are gone and dead or whatever. And then there's just this hooded man yeah. that, that just like approaches him and it just like the movie ends. It's yeah. It, it it's a great closing. Um, it 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 feels good. Uh, to know that you know. Not not too many movies let evil win at the yeah. end, so I, I always is, is I really enjoy definitely that. a theme with H.P. Lovecraft. Is yeah, it's always about the rising of evil. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I mean, it's like, are we really the true evil? That's also a thing that often gets kicked around a little bit. Well, I'll tell you this uh, again. I mean, you've heard it a hundred times. The script kicked a lot of ass. I was I, I i wanted to read this script because mm-hmm. like the last script we did it was it was unknown we were interested by the it was uh the aries script right right we were interested by the premise mm-hmm. and overall was surprised by something we knew sure. nothing about this i at least had an idea about but i had no idea i was going to enjoy it this much yeah i uh i knew a lot about cthulhu and uh yeah. j- just the mythos and w- whatever goes with that but um and, and i knew this story in particular it's, mm-hmm. it's my favorite i've actually read most of this one yeah i, I do want to go back and finish it well definitely. um but i want to see this movie made so bad yeah it, it sounds pretty and, badass yeah. as long as the uh i guess as long as the cg uh feels you know uh believable yeah um if they could uh throw in some uh practical effects as well i think they could get away with a lot of practical effects in Mm -hmm. this movie i mean obviously you would probably need some cg assistance of course but i think you could like with like the tentacles and things like Mm -hmm. that but i think you could do a lot of the ancient ones with some good practical effects mixed with cg especially it being uh guillermo del toro uh the man's incredible when it comes to his costumes and his designs so uh, I would I would definitely feel comfortable putting this uh, story in his hands. Absolutely, and from what I understand, this is his passion project. Mm-hmm. It's something he's tried to get, which to me is another bummer if it never happens. Yeah, um, I really hope it does. But I, like another interesting thing is, so he he's known for keeping journals of uh-huh. his movies and stuff, and you can go back and see like, oh, here's some sketches he did for Pan's Labyrinth and stuff. There are sketches and things. Yeah, for I've, this seen, I've seen a couple of things. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's really cool that he put those out. Mm-hmm. Um, I I want to see this movie so bad. That's yeah. really all. I, that's like all I can say about it. Um, how, how do you feel? Uh, you know, general public would uh, view the movie. I think it would do really well if released at the right time. Okay. Um, I think that would be the tricky part. Like, I think the gut would be like, oh, it's a horror movie. Release it around Halloween. But right. I think it could do better, maybe like November, December, sure ish. Um. I think it would be successful. I don't. I'm assuming you would need at least a hundred million dollar budget for something like this. Okay. Um, I don't think it would be gangbusters, just because for one, a lot of his movies haven't made a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Like, they're. I think they've done pretty well for themselves. Sure. I'm trying to think of. Well, I mean, we got ourselves Hellboy and uh, Pacific yeah. Rim. I'm pretty sure Pacific is fucking Rim. killing it internationally. I remember Pacific Rim was kind of a disappointment. Like, I think it made money, but it didn't yeah. make a lot of money. Okay. Like, I think it barely crossed its budget or something like that. Maybe. I don't know what Pan's Labyrinth did. I assume that movie... I assume it was also lower on the scale. Because I, it, I never saw like a, Pan's Labyrinth. Oh, that's an amazing movie. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I've i I've owned it. I've been sitting on a copy of it for a very long time. <laughs> no excuses. I have none. I really should watch that. And I, I'm not a huge Hellboy fan. I know mm-hmm. people really like those movies. Sure. I heard the second one was better. I haven't seen the second one. They're both great. Uh, the first I, one did not blow me away. Again, um, with Guillermo, it's always set design, costumes, creations. Uh, just the and creatures are always fucking incredible. Yeah. Okay, Pan's Labyrinth did really fucking well. It made $83 million on a $19 million budget. So. Okay. And then uh, y- you ready for Pacific Rim? Yeah, let's Pacific Rim's budget was $190 million. Its box Oof. office was four hundred and eleven million. Really? Okay. Yeah. So it 
fucking crushed it. I, I I definitely think that was more of a worldwide box office. Oh, like totally. You said. No, yeah. And that's the problem with Hollywood is like, oh, it didn't make that much in the states, so we shouldn't make another one. And they've been struggling to get the sequel made, but I guess they're filming it right now. Well, I tell you, uh, Hollywood is uh, kind of going down where uh, China is uh, slowly moving up. Yeah, because I know they're building their own fucking Hollywood over there. With I mean, uh, they're the second biggest market next to us. So. Sure. Yeah, and uh, I'm pretty sure they could throw a lot more money at movies nowadays. Yeah, a little bit more propaganda, but hey, that's not my thing. <laughs> But uh, um, no, nah, um, I I don't know. In closing, I thought this uh, movie this movie would be awesome. The script kicked ass. The characters were a lot of fun to read about, and yes. the monsters were very different. No, yeah. This is a very different uh, looking movie than you're gonna come across. Yeah, it, it's a fantastic adaptation. Mm-hmm. Like I would maybe change like one or two little things. Sure, I think little could, stuff. But yeah, make it slightly more horrific. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, very minor. Oh yeah, things like I could see this. Like if this draft got made as it was, I'd be okay with it. Like I would definitely walk out being like, oh, it could have been a little better, but sure. I really enjoyed that movie. Kind of mm-hmm. like Prometheus. Could have been a little better, but I really enjoyed. Yeah, that movie. little things. You know, you're not gonna have yourself a hundred uh, percent movie over there, but yeah. Uh, you know, you, which I will say, the original script for Prometheus, which will come out mm-hmm. when Alien Covenant comes out on this show, um, is a much better movie. Okay. Um, I know a lot of people are interested in that one, so I don't know who's cool. gonna. You guys are all gonna have to fight for whoever wants to do that <laughs> one. All but, right. Um, because I know Vinny and Nick both wanted. I know you and you were interested in that one too. Yeah, no, I'll, um, I'll let Vinny and I maybe have uh, maybe I've overstayed my welcome. Oh no, over no, here. no, no. I, I, you're one of my favorite guests. All to right, have on, Eric. well, thank you. Um, but no, I will say that that original script is a much better movie. Okay, and it's it's really good. Cool. Um, yeah. Is there anything else we need to say on the scripts? Uh, I mean, I highly implore people. Go to our blog and read mm-hmm. it if you haven't. It's so good. Yeah. And it, like you said, a quick read. It's a quick read. It's a lot of fun. And uh, I have a feeling that as you're reading it, you're just going to be sitting there like, get the fuck out of here. No yeah. way. Oh, yeah. my God. You know, just sitting here being blown away by what you're actually reading. Yeah. Like the last half of the script, it's mm-hmm. really hard to put down. Yeah. Um, just such good imagery and just the way it visualizes off the page is amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, but all right, man. Thanks for sitting with me. Absolutely. Thank Thanks you for, for having me oh, again. No problem. And I'm glad you could read this one with me. Oh, yeah. I, I knew this one was going to be a lot of fun to talk yeah, to. It was uh, a good time. Talk about. Um, I had a lot of fun talking about this one. Cool. So, Thanks right. a lot, man. And don't forget, everybody, you can follow our show on Twitter at Shelved Podcast. Um, you can email us at Shelved Film Podcast at gmail.com. And we have the script on our Tumblr if you want to go pull it off there, Shelved Film Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe and rate and review the show on iTunes. Because we will read those reviews on the mini episode. Mm -hmm. (laughs) All right. But all right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Eric, thanks. Thanks, guys.